welcome everybody uh, to this week's uh, leadership training workshop. Uh, today's topic is on crucial accountability and is led by Mr. John and Mr. Shop. And uh, hopefully you've read the fundamental attribution error document, uh, which we'll be referencing. Um, the link is there um, in the handout slides, which I'm gonna paste in one more time, um, at least one more time into the chat so you can get access to those. Um, one thing I wanna remind everybody of is uh, we all have different roles to play in this evening um, as we go through this workshop. Uh, some of you have, have seen uh, some of this material before in terms of crucial accountability. Um, and for many of you, it's gonna be the first time. Um, so help, uh, help support each other uh, as, you, as you share your insights. Um, and for those of you with more experience in the topic, provide some space for those newer to it to develop their, their understanding as well. Um, and we'll try to, uh, as we ask people to share out, distribute that among everybody so we get a variety of voices this evening. Um, so with that introduction, welcome uh, and thank you to uh, Mr. John and Mr. Shop and go ahead and, and take it away. All right, thank you very much. So I'm very happy to see all of you here again. Um, I'd especially like to welcome any guests that we might have from outside the team, as well as uh, new members to our team or new members joining us for our leadership workshop. Uh, I'd also like to especially thank Mr. Chop for stepping in to present with me this year. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about the ideas and tools in this book called Crucial Accountability. The team captains requested this after I introduced the concept a couple of years ago. Uh, this book is from the same group that brought us crucial conversations, so you will hopefully recognize the parts that overlap. We do our best to only remind you of those parts and not reteach them so we can focus on the accountability aspects. Much like crucial conversations, you will want to begin with the end in mind when you are working on accountability with another person. You want to know what you want for them, for you, for the relationship, and you want to know what you don't want as an outcome. And just like in a crucial conversation, if you notice it going off the rails, verbally pause the conversation and see if you can start over, vocally answering these questions. Now, crucial conversations and accountability are both long-term investments in our team. They are not shortcuts. You will each need to do this long-range work to benefit from it. Trust, and therefore culture, hurts when accountability is lacking. So we want to work at getting this right. We note trust here, and we'll focus on it more later because team culture is built on all of the relationships in the team. The foundation of relationships is trust. Here are the main points we're going to address tonight. Please take a moment to read these to yourself. All right, we asked you to read the article about the fundamental attribution error. Speaking from experience, when you make the fundamental attribution error and assume that the other person did not meet their commitment because they are a bad person, it's like you've told yourself a victim or a villain story from the crucial conversations training that we had. After that, it is really easy to have your motives shift and want to punish the other person. Very quickly, you will find yourself putting the other person in their place for being the lazy, no good person that you have told yourself they are. But what does that do for your relationship with them? Will you be respected and welcomed by others after you berate them? If you were the person who lost the argument, would you feel good about giving this team all of your free time? So 
if we come across an accountability issue with a team member and we fall into the fundamental attribution error, we will likely first think that the person is not motivated to do a good job. That's the main basis of the fundamental attribution error. Or maybe we think way outside of that box and think that they don't have the ability. But even then, we will miss all of these other possibilities. The six sources of influence are grouped into motivational influences and ability influences. Each of these is subgrouped into personal, social, and structural influences. With these simple examples, we hope that you can see the similarities and differences across a single row or a column. So let's just step through these. Personal motivation. I just don't want to change the light bulb today. Social motivation. My friends all say it is better to study in the dark. That's why I'm not going to change the light bulb. Structural motivation. It's not my job to change the bulb. It's my parents' job. Now let's look at the ability side. Personal ability. I can't reach the box of bulbs. It's too high in the cabinet. Social ability. I've got all these chores and homework that I have to get done. There's no time to change a light bulb. Or structural ability. We simply don't have any new bulbs in the cabinet to go and change this one out. So hopefully you can see how those different types of motivation and ability uh, within the personal, social, and structural subsets can, can act on an individual person. And Mr. Schmidt, one more time, if you could drop the link to the slides in the chat again. We're about to break into groups. So please be sure to introduce yourselves to each other. We'll have time for a few groups to report out. So choose a speaker for your group. And as we said, we're gonna to try to have different speakers each time. Um, before we, <clears throat> excuse me. What I want you to do is what's right here on this slide. Look at these different ability and motivation sources of influence. And in your groups, come up with two or more of those sources of influence and see if you can make it robotics related. You're going to have five minutes. And since you have five minutes, that means there's going to be a countdown timer with four minutes. And when the four minutes is up, you still have one more minute, there will be a new countdown timer. So go ahead and use the time, talk your way through these. And if they're really easy to do, that's great. Come up with how could you apply this as you are going forward. Of course, we're gonna talk a lot more about that. Ready to break them up into teams, Mr. Schmidt? I am, here we go. Thank you. Okay. I think everybody's back. Um, if uh, somebody wants to raise their hand for personal motivation, give me a personal motivation uh, potential. Lodum, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, we were, our group was debating whether this was personal motivation or personal ability, but not having enough time because you're doing another winter sport or something for robotics? I, I, I would say uh, you can definitely make that a, a personal motivation because that's still a choice where you spend your time mm -hmm. if you're motivated enough, right? Okay, very good. Thank you, Lodum. Can I get an, uh, somebody raise their hand for ability personal? Jack. Okay, so this one is a little on the fence between personal ability and structural, but our team kind of had this merged one of not wanting to work on a project because like it wasn't catted, but so that could be a structural problem of 
it's not to you yet. It's not like to, the project isn't in your hands, but you could also go to the catter and offer your help. But if you don't want to, because like catting is scary, that could be a personal ability or influence. And yeah, I, I, I totally go with that. Um, personal ability because the, the job is not ready for you to get it done yet. But I can see the overlap into the structural. Obviously, something else is, is waiting. Very good. Um, somebody for uh, motivation social. Nobody for motivation social. All right, I'll throw one out. Uh, one of the captains just came in the room and said we have to be out in five minutes in a hurry. That would be social motivation. All right, do I have somebody for social ability? Any hands for social ability? Okay, I'll give you one. I asked three people where to put this part. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. How do I turn this off? <laughs> there it goes. OK. Um, social ability, you said? Yeah. Honestly, I clicked that without thinking about it. I wanted to have an example and then I blanked. I'm sorry. No worries. All right. So. <clears throat> Uh, one example could be, I asked three people where to put this part, but they were all too busy cleaning up to help me. So social ability. Um, does anybody have something for structural motivation? Helena. Um, something my group talked about was just like cleaning up duties where it's like maybe somebody enters a room or they haven't really been doing a task but then they're asked to clean up on it and so structurally they think that they probably shouldn't be required to do that um and that just like maybe some lowered motivation and then how to make it more of a like team contribution thing um and not just like very specific structural roles okay okay very good um and then can i have somebody for structural ability Andrea. We said not having a tool to do a task. Yep, very good, very good. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, we're gonna keep moving on because we've got lots more stuff to cover. Thank you all for sharing and thank you all for raising your hands. All right, let's take a look at what we as servant leaders can do to address these six sources of influences. We will start with make it motivating and then move on to make it easy for the ability influences. Most team members do not attend the sprint planning meetings and are not necessarily aware of the complex interdependencies of each sub team to the other sub teams. They might not see how their actions can help the team meet the team's goals. In other words, they might not feel needed. In this case, your job is to help the other person to understand these potential outcomes that they cannot see and why it is important for them to do the task so that they can see how their actions can directly help the team. This will help them to develop the motivation to find ways to get the task done, even if they run into problems. Check for their understanding. Try another example if they don't understand. But stop in the name of love. Don't keep piling it on. As soon as they understand, your job of providing examples is done. So now you know the two main skills of make it motivating, and you know that Mr. John can't sing. These two main skills apply to situations where the person is having problems with personal, social, or structural motivation. Mr. Chop and I are about to provide you with an example conversation. After that, we'll go into breakout rooms and you will have the opportunity to figure out how to apply to the example. 
In this example, we're going to introduce a crucial accountability situation that is going to play out over five different acts. This first one is the longest. It will set the stage for the following examples, and it covers the make it motivating skills that we just presented. Here we go with act one. Mr. Chop, do you have a moment? Sure. I noticed this afternoon that it appears that you didn't update the Trello card for assembling the mystery mechanism. I just came from 116 and they're trying to find the gusset used to rivet the mystery mechanism to the robot. Oh, I know where that is. I put it on the assembly RSU last night. I'll get it right now. So Mr. Chop leaves to get the gusset and returns a few minutes later. But while he's gone, Mr. John thinks to himself, Here's another example of Mr. Chop being too lazy to do the right thing. He's always so lazy. Wait a minute, that's not really true. There are probably other factors that led to all of this. All good now. <laughs> Thank you for getting the gusset. I would still like to discuss the team's expectations for leaving sufficient breadcrumbs for a task at the end of the meeting and how it appears you didn't do that last night with respect to the mystery mechanism. Mm, okay, I guess. You know, a lot of people don't update uh, Trello. I agree with you that others don't consistently update Trello. I'm working with them as well. Right now, I would like to focus on why updating Trello is so important. Mm, okay. As the project manager, I review all of the Trello cards before the meeting to create a high level plan. If a card isn't updated, I don't know the status of that story or task and I can't effectively plan the meeting. As a result, other tasks may end up getting blocked or unexpectedly delayed. The team isn't as productive without an effective plan. Oh, I didn't realize that you read the cards before each meeting. That does make it more important. And it's not just about me. Today, you are busy revising essays for the Impact Award, which is really important. As a result, others are working on the mystery mechanism. Without the Trello card updated, they had to ask around until they found people who understood the current status. They didn't want to interrupt you since you're working on the Impact Award today. Yeah, last night I forgot that I'd be working on Impact Award today, and I thought I'd still be working on the Mystery Mechanism Assembly. So I didn't think upgrading Trello was uh, that important since I knew what to do next. Well, that is understandable. Plans often change. You might miss a meeting unexpectedly or be pulled into a higher priority task. Our schedule this year is really aggressive. We need to be efficient which means everyone needs to be able to quickly figure out the status of any task. Yeah, that makes sense. Back to the gusset. While you were able to find it quickly, what if you weren't here today? Right, yeah, unexpected absence again. Or what if another team member found the gusset on the assembly RSU and moved it onto a shelf in holography to make room to work on another task, and then you wouldn't have been able to find it quickly? Yeah, that's happened in the past. Or what if another team member mistakes it for a gusset for a different mechanism and tries to use it to assemble that mechanism? That's a bit of a stretch. It is a unique part, but I see your point. Or what if Mr. Jurup makes a run to the scrap metal center and grabs the gusset for recycling, since it's not in a tote? And Okay, okay, I get it. and scene. <clears throat> That's the end of the first act. Mr. John really didn't stop in the name of love, did he? Take a moment and remember the conversation you just heard and the issue of not noting the next step to be done on the Trello card. My character was trying to make the invisible visible. I was trying to help Mr. Chop understand why updating Trello with the next step is critical. For this breakout room, 
choose one of these four make the invisible visible statements and come up with the type of member for who this could be an effective explanation. You know, this, this explanation could work well for different members. We just really want you to, to be creative and think of, oh, this type of member, uh, maybe somebody who's very new, maybe somebody who just walked in the room, somebody who uh, was working on this for hours, uh, but didn't realize, you know, whatever. Come up with a backstory for the member who this would, this example would be a, an effective explanation and why you think it would help this particular fictional member you're gonna create. Now also remember to choose someone to report out who is not already reported out. You'll have five minutes, which means there'll be a countdown timer for four minutes, and then it'll reset to one minute after that four minute countdown. Go ahead, Mr. Schmidt, when you're ready. All right, here we go. All right, welcome back, everyone. Very good. All right, um, do we have anyone who wanted to talk about the, the first one? You don't remember exactly what you had to do next. Okay, anybody, nobody took that one? Anybody take the people Aaron, Okay, Aaron, go ahead. I actually have an idea this time. <laughs> Excellent. Um, probably someone relatively new, not exactly familiar with the process of things, or assuming it's a literal path, the layout of our side of the building. Hmm. So best to keep it probably a little bit brief then, like it is right now, just to make sure it's not overwhelming. And uh, why? Because we tend to have patterns in the way we do things. I see a lot of similarities this year as to last year. So there's a lot of differences you can make one year to the next. Okay. Very good. Thank you for sharing. All right. How about uh, the people lose their respect for you because you didn't share the next step? Did anybody do this one? Okay. How about time is wasted during the sprint meeting? Anybody talk about that one? Raj. Yeah, so we were kind of just talking about how, especially for this example, it's kind of like a snowball effect that really affects the entire team because not only is time being wasted that, um, like that affects the leadership team, the captains, the mentors, the members that the leadership team could be working with, but it's also affecting time um, that could be spent like discussing things that could be discussed outside of robotics versus things that can only really be done inside robotics. So in terms of this scenario, it affects pretty much like the majority of the team. And, and what kind of person would it be good to, to explain that to? What is a, a potential kind of person? probably the project manager because they're usually the ones um, running the sprint planning meetings. Oh, oh, I see what you're, okay. I see where you're coming from there. Um, if the if the project manager is, is going down a, a, a rabbit trail and, and uh, that's wasting a lot of time there. When I had written this um, or when, Mr. Schmidt and I had written this. I can't remember which one of us came up with it. Um, we were thinking more along the lines of if information is not updated on on the on the Trello cards uh, by an individual member, then there's going to be time wasted because some people will know that. Oh well, no, there there was. I saw something got done there. Well, what got done? Well, I don't know. Well, who was supposed to be doing it? Yeah, they, they, and that's wasting time as well. So, uh, but I I always like when somebody can see something from a different perspective and say, yeah, this could also apply over here. So, all right, thank you guys. And then for the last one, did anybody uh, come up with somebody for this, Franklin? 
Yeah, so for the last one, we were saying that um, because, say, like, the catting took too long, then that means that everything else couldn't happen because all of this is, it's like the structural accountability that, um, the structural ability that everybody has, there's a path. You have to follow the path and you can't skip ahead. So you can't wear the robot before it's built, so on and so on. This would be a good thing to explain probably to all the leads and FPMs just to explain like we, we have to have a schedule and everything has to go on schedule. And if it doesn't go on schedule, we're going to run into problems at the end of the season that aren't immediately foreseeable now. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you all very much. All right. Well, uh, I am uh, Mr. Sh Mr. Chop. Are you ready to... Uh, for me to hand it over to you for the next portion. I am Excellent. ready, sir. Um, I will find my way to stop sharing. There you go. And do you see my screen? Yes, make it easy. Okay. Now let's turn to ability issues. Making other people's jobs easy is the main focus of leaders. Remember, this is not a motivation issue. This is an ability issue. So we are not trying to encourage people to do painful, tedious, obnoxious work, but instead finding ways to make the work less painful, tedious, or obnoxious. When you've determined what the problem or source of influence is, say to them, you've been working on this. What do you think should be done? If you provide the answer, you may both overlook a better solution. That is power bias. You will also steal from them the ability to practice finding solutions. Agree and support their idea if it looks like it will work. Partner with them in brainstorming if you have major concerns. Let's focus on buy-in for a moment. A solution that's tactically inferior, but has the full commitment of those who implement it may be more effective than one that's tactically superior, but is resisted by those who have to make it work. In other words, don't fall into the trap of wanting the other person to pick your idea because you think it's best. It will certainly not be the best idea if it doesn't get done. It is important to note that like in crucial conversations, you may find yourself needing to repeat, but here the issue is more that the person may not feel comfortable telling you the whole story at the beginning. So after you have worked on a motivation problem, you need to check if there's any other roadblocks stopping them from completing the task. There might be an ability problem. You might not know until you get curious and ask them. Is there anything that you know now that could keep you from getting the task done? Asking will not get you the answer if you have not shown compassion and built trust. This time we're going to have a breakout before we do an example. What does it feel like when somebody asks you for your idea on how to solve a problem? and totally ignores your idea and tells you what to do. Or they have the correct answer in mind and they hint until you get it. How did you feel? What was awkward? What could you have done to help the conversation go in a better direction? What can you do to not put someone else through this? Mr. Schmidt, are you ready for breakout room, sir? I am. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. So we'd like to hear from um, two or three uh, individual groups. Raise your hand if you'd like to share. Um, Aiden. Um, for the first one, me and my group talked about how uh, it feels disingenuous. Um, when someone asks for your ideas and doesn't really consider them and it feels like you're being like built up and just let down for, for no reason. Or, you know. Yeah, I could see that. 
and 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 not very inclusive either. Um, okay, someone's gonna have to help me with some names because I don't know everybody's name here. I see Ayush. Is that correct? Yeah, Ayush. Um, okay. So yeah, so for the first question, uh, my group and I um, talks like what similar to what Aiden was saying about it kind of like kind of puts you down, um, makes you really feel down, like your voice isn't really like, I guess, valued um, in whatever conversation um, is happening. And then for the second one, we kind of saw it like two ways, like in a sense, sometimes like if there is like one explicit correct answer, like hinting to that answer instead of giving the answer right away can be a good thing um, in a sense for learning. But then also if it's like a really open ended like conversation and kind of limiting um, what like what whoever is like answering the question can think like that's really I guess uh demoting and like it kind of like limits their ideas and creativity I would say okay I could see that uh, how do you pronounce j-a-i okay just j, j by but it's okay good. uh so we we talked about the first one's like demotivating for whoever's trying to give the ideas it's like they don't matter so yeah it, I I could totally see that. I, I think I would feel that way if, if I gave an idea and, and they said, and they just completely glanced over it and didn't do anything. Yeah. And then also like, even if they do have a good idea, they're less likely to say it in the future. Yeah. Why would you want to say something if the guy isn't, you know, if that person isn't ever going to um, uh, take your idea and, and consider it worthy? Okay. Mr. John, how many more do we want to uh, have present? Oh, uh, one more, Sanyukta. So we talked about number one. Uh, wait, wait, what was I going to say? All right. Um, uh, well, um, so it makes you feel unimportant, especially when other person is like a leader, on, like they're in a superior um, position, right? So you know, my ideas ignore it. And I always pose the question, like, why ask me when you already know, like, when you already have your own idea? I almost feel like it makes you feel unimportant, like, when you, they don't value your thoughts, you know, things. Very good. Okay. Thank you for everyone for sharing. Now let's move on to the next slide. So act two. Now that you have thought through awkwardness and pain that, that can happen when somebody doesn't know the skills of make it easy, let's take a look at a conversation that puts make it easy skills to good use. We pick up where the conversation left off in an alternate universe where Mr. John knew to stop in the name of love. And Mr. Shop is now motivated, but is not sure how to proceed. So what should I do differently? Since you are the one who has to clean up at the end of meetings and make sure there are enough breadcrumbs for the next day, I'm more interested in what you think you should do. Hmm. I guess it's not that hard. I should just update Trello and put the parts back in the tote. It sounds easy, but we know that it's not. We identified a couple of influences that made it challenging to do yesterday. That's true. In terms of updating Trello, I am busy with homework when I get home after robotics, and I don't think I can reliably update Trello after the meeting. It's good to be honest with yourself. So what's another option? Hmm. I suppose I could set an alarm for 840 every night. That would give me and everyone else time to update Trello and put everything away where it belongs. I'm a little skeptical that 20 minutes is enough, but I'm willing to give it a try since it's Mr. Chop's idea. That sounds like a workable plan. If you share this plan with the whole team, you can all hold each other accountable when the alarm goes off. That's a good idea. Okay. Is there anything else that you know of that could cause this to not work for you? Not that I can think of. Great. 
then can I meet up with you by five o'clock at the next meeting to see how tonight's breadcrumbs worked? Sure. That is the end of the second act. Congratulations. You have now opened your mind to the first half of crucial accountability. This knowledge will help you get past the fundamental attribution error of thinking that a person is lazy, incapable, or evil. These skills will help you remove the roadblocks of motivation and ability like any good servant leader should do. This will take practice. Remember back to the prior two weeks and the definition of compassion as empathy and action. Action requires work. You're going to have to put in the work of trying, sometimes failing and trying again. And remember being transparent is about failure being transparent about failure is one of the strengths of a team player. Now we can learn how to make a good accountability plan. The plan is very straightforward. The first three steps, who does what by when, are very easy to lay out. Remember to be specific. For instance, what in does what step, make sure you both agree on what done looks like. Is it that the prototype has been built or has it been tested? Maybe the list of parts has not only been prioritized, but it's also been communicated to the person responsible for the next step. Now the by when generally means a date and a time. Let me provide a counter example. Does done by Thursday mean it will be done before the meeting starts or by the end of the meeting? It might mean two very different things to people in the conversation. So get rid of the confusion. Specify the date and the time. For example, have it done by Wednesday at 530 so that you can report out at the supper meeting. Then you agree to a follow-up method and summarize the plan. We will talk more about follow-up soon. Let's focus for a moment on summarizing the plan. It simply means that after the who does what by when and follow-up have been discussed, you'll want to put it together in one statement and check for agreement. For example, so we said that you would inventory all the shop bot bits and post the list to the open Trello card by the end of Saturday's meeting. We also said that you would check in with me Saturday at lunch to let me know how it's going. Do you agree to this plan? That's all it is, a summary with a question for their agreement. Let's focus on the follow-up. We all want to believe that if we had a conversation and agreed to the plan, then the other person is going to have no problem getting the work done on time and to specification. But we have also learned today that there is a framework for the things that we have always known can get in our way. We may not have the words for it previously, but many of us have known that our motivation and ability are affected by personal, social, and structural influences. Given this personal reality, we have to recognize that these six sources of influence are going to continue to affect the person even after the accountability conversation. That is why we need to do a follow-up. But following up with someone can be tricky. If you have too many follow-ups, they might feel like you're micromanaging them. Not enough follow-ups. Or if you forget to follow up with them, they can feel you don't care. That is why we also need to agree with the person on a frequency of the follow-up. Note, some tasks 
are small and can be done in a relatively short time frame. Some are longer and lend themselves to more frequent status checks, similar to your project management reviews. Lastly, there may be reasons why the person assigning the task should follow up, and there may be reasons why the person who owns the task should perform the follow-up. That is why we also need to agree with the other person on how to follow up. If you are nervous that the task and person combo is going to run into problems from any of the six sources of influence, then propose a checkup. You own this checkup. So you need to make sure that you remind yourself in a proven way to, to do the checkup. Make an alarm on your phone, a calendar appointment, a Trello card with a reminder, whatever works for you. If you are feeling more confident that the task and person combo is now going to run smoothly, ask them to check back with you. Either way, make sure that you build agreement with the follow-up. You do not want to force an agreement because as you don't learn in physics, force equals make angry. Act number three. We join the action right after the last time when they had finished discussing the who does what by when. I'd like to check up on how this is working for you during the next meeting. Uh, I don't think it's needed, but okay. It's always good to close the loop and to make sure our plan works as expected. Well, that makes sense. Okay, let me summarize to make sure we are both on the same page. You are going to set a repeating alarm now for 840 for each meeting starting with today's meeting. The alarm will remind you to start the mental and physical cleanup which includes both updating Trello with enough breadcrumbs that another team member can pick up the work if you aren't here, and getting parts labeled and put into totes. I will find you by 5 p.m. at the next meeting to see how the breadcrumbs worked. Did I get that right? Yeah, that is the plan. That is the end of the third act. And Mr. Schmidt, I believe Mr. John has this scheduled for a longer breakout session this time. Right, so I've got this set for seven minutes total. So you're gonna see six minutes countdown in your room, and then I'll give you 60 more seconds to wrap up your conversation. So the accountability plan is very straightforward. And the example you just heard was relatively easy. This normally doesn't happen. It doesn't happen on student teams. It doesn't happen in corporate America. So we would like you to take some time in your breakout room and discuss the following two questions. What is going to be personally difficult and awkward about developing and communicating accountability plan? What can you do to overcome personal difficulties and awkwardness? We're going to give you a couple extra minutes and we'd like to hear from a few when you get back. All right, here we go. All right, welcome back everyone. Right. Okay, so uh, we'd like to hear from, uh, let's say three groups. Let's see, I see Andrea's hands up. Our group said that remembering to follow up would be a challenge because remembering things in general is a challenge. And a couple ways we can like help overcome that is either to ask people to check back more than we would or to set our own alarms to remember to check in with them. I definitely like to set the own alarms as uh, I find that helpful in my own life. Okay, uh, Simi. Um, so my group talked about that being really specific about um, this accountability plan is especially difficult just because it's also really important that um, you both understand what the goals at the end of this plan 
and I find it difficult because <clears throat> it's just it's tough to both understand what interpretation of the result that you want to have depending on uh, just depending on like what you what your perspective is on the problem so yeah thank you thank you for sharing Mahir uh, yeah so our group also said something similar about like being specific and like uh having to like list out all the like small um things that y'all might not agree on um and like in order to overcome that i think you could like start with like the bigger things that uh you might like have to agree on and then you can kind of break it down um so that you're not just going like super into detail at first yeah i i agree um i think it's having an accountability plan is definitely something that's really important. And I think that, that as, as you guys um, progress through the year, you'll see, especially as you start building the robot, you'll see how important it is to um, set those obtainable goals, uh, um, know that somebody's accountable for them with a specific date in mind um, so that you can, the project managers can really keep on top of the project and make it make sure that they're focusing on where it's going. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for sharing. This whole script that we gave you sounds great, but what happens when the person starts adding on other problems? They're starting to sound like excuses, but they aren't. They're emergent problems. Perhaps you haven't explored all the problems well enough. Perhaps they didn't feel it was safe to share until they are having to commit. You need to be focused and flexible, flexible to take on a new item, but focused to be able to prioritize and deal with issues or the pattern of issues that the other person brings up. A violation of trust is the highest priority emergent issue. Remember back to the introduction. Trust is the foundation for all of the relationships on the team and for team culture. When trust is broken, it quickly affects relationships and can start to pull apart the entire team culture. If not addressed immediately, then it will quickly get out of uh, get out of hand and your goals will be out of reach. To address it well, you have to lean heavily on the strengths of team of a team player to ensure that you begin with the end in mind. Use compassion when discussing a violation of trust. Remember, uh, remind yourself that you really want for both of you, uh, hang on, remind yourself what you really want for both of you and what you don't want to happen as a result of what you're about to say. Pause, think, then talk. When discovering broken trust, it will be easy to tell yourself a clever victim, villain, or helpless story. You will need to be aware of that potential and learn to look for your emotions coming out. Remember this slide from last week, it applies here too. Watch for emergent issues in the account accountability conversation to turn crucial when suddenly you, they, or both of you acting out your feelings because you told yourself a clever story based on something you saw or heard. If they're acting out, then you can help them retrace their path. Remember the ask mirror paraphrase and suggest skills from the prior crucial conversations training. If you or both of you are acting out, you may need some space to cool down and plan before restarting the conversation. You, you are likely going to use the apologize, contrasting and retracing your path skills from prior training. 
We rejoined the action at the next meeting after Mr. John's alarm reminded him to check up on Mr. Shop. Afterwards, we're going to ask you to analyze how they built trust back into the relationship. Watch for how they rebuild trust. It looks like everything was put back last night where it belongs. The team got a quick start today on their tasks. Yep, all good now. I also noticed that it appears that Trello wasn't updated for the mystery mechanism assembly story. I also noticed that you're bothering me again and keeping me from assembling the mystery mechanism. We all know what we're doing. You have to make a big deal out of updating Trello yesterday. My primary concern at the moment is not that you didn't update Trello. It's that you made a commitment to me to execute our plan. I trusted that you would do so and it didn't get done. That's a more significant issue for us to discuss. If you care about Trello, why don't you update it? Again, the primary concern at the moment isn't Trello. It's the trust in our relationship. What do you think was the obstacle that prevented you from following through on the plan? I just didn't feel like it. I feel that our relationship hasn't been as strong since I was named project manager. I heard that you applied for the position as well. Does that have anything to do with this? Maybe. It certainly hasn't been easy watching you in the position that I wanted. The conversation continues. I'm glad that you have the confidence to share that with me. That's not easy to say. I feel that when you applied for the position, you took it away from me. I guess I'm telling myself a villain story, aren't I? Perhaps. I didn't apply for the role to keep you from getting it. I did apply because I thought it was how I could best help the team. I know, I know. While I know I should have a team player mindset, it's still really hard at times because I really wanted that role. It's totally normal to feel that way. You are making a huge difference with your input on the impact award essays and the things you've learned about the mystery mechanism. Thanks. I may need some help to make sure I don't fall into a victim or villain story in the future. All uh, right, last, I think this is our last, this is our last breakout. Um, in the example, how could they use crucial conversation skills? How did this help them build relationship? How did this help them build trust? So I'd like you guys to, to deliberate on this and have a couple people ready to provide some answers after the breakout. All right, here we go. Hello, welcome back. So we'd like to take two people, two groups to report back what they discussed. Raj? Yeah, so we were talking primarily about how Mr. John in that situation seemed to be more of an empathetic leader because rather than focusing on attacking the person at hand, he was more so trying to refocus the situation um, so that they were talking about the issue and maintaining a level of professionalism. Um, and I think one thing that um, we were talking about with the mentors in our, in our group was that um, it demonstrates a level of maturity that really takes your leadership to the next level um, where you're able to control your emotions and keep your personal feelings out of the situation to try and alleviate the tension. Yeah, I think that Mr. John was really trying to get to the root of the problem, right? And he found a, a very nice way to, to tease some of that information out. Um, Declan. Yeah, we said he used the ask skill very effectively, like, because he realized that there was something going on here, maybe not as surface level, Mr. John did, 
And he got to the bottom of that and figured out how to resolve the issue they were having. Yeah, and, and how important was it for them to get to the root of that problem so they could begin again at the at the building trust level? Mr. John, are you ready to take over? Yep. All right, so thank you very much. In the larger culture that we have grown up in, there's a strong emphasis on celebrating big accomplishments. The person who is in the right place at the right time to save the day gets many accolades that are often over the top. But what about the people who day in and day out show up and get the work done? The people who routinely reduce the risk of failure by following the work processes, the people who communicate early when they see an impending problem. When they see that save the day person reaping the rewards of being lucky, this might cause their motivation to falter. This is a social motivation issue. If the people around them only celebrate big accomplishments, then they are going to look for ways to have a big accomplishment and or they're going to get burned out. If your organization only celebrates these lucky people, then it is a structural motivation as well. So when you read this line at the top about praising more than you think you should, we don't mean throwing huge parties. We do mean finding ways to praise people for doing their job well, ways that will motivate them to keep doing good work. Some of the people who do this praising job very well will regularly set aside time to look for things that they can praise. They also will make sure to create the appropriate social influences by celebrating individuals in private. Nope, oh, we're up to act five. During the next meeting, Mr. John passes Mr. Chop in the hall. Thank you for updating the Trello card for your story. Your notes made it faster for me to preliminarily plan for our next sprint. You're welcome. And later, while waiting in line for dinner, thanks for labeling the custom motor mount and putting it in the tote. That made it really easy for the new members to get started on today's task. Sure thing. And by the way, I had an idea for how to make our sprint planning meetings more efficient. Wonderful. What's your idea? Did you notice how celebrating Mr. Chop's following of the process also led to him feeling more comfortable to offer a suggestion? In this breakout, we want you to think about the kinds of things that we do not currently celebrate, but probably should. Also discuss how we could celebrate those things gone right. And then right there in the middle of your breakout, start capturing them in the celebration Google form. You can click right on this in your, in your slides. This will populate a document that you can then use as a KFT, a keep fix try prior to start of the season. So you can figure out how to start appropriately celebrating and reinforcing the good choices and actions of people and teams. Let's go for about four minutes, Mr. Schmidt. So a three minute countdown. I'm sorry to switch that on you at the last second. Oh, all good. Here we go. Okay. Is this me? Am I doing things? It is you. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, hopefully, if you were able to put some things in the celebration form, uh, you can go back and put even more things in the celebration Google form for, for later as well. So congratulations. We have made it to the summary of the crucial accountability presentation. Here in one flow, you can see all of the steps. And there's a lot of steps. But for those of you who don't like flow charts, here's a play on words to move from accountability in action 
to accountability in action. You just need to insert a space. Seek their issues. Provide room for them to grow. Accept their solutions. Celebrate their work. Earn their trust. These skills probably can't be applied consistently and successfully after just a 90 minute workshop. They require practice and mental preparation. These conversations are really challenging to do well. That's not an excuse not to have them. It's just the reality. That means that you will have to listen well to see when someone is using these skills to help you with the problem. And you will be, have to be ready to apologize if you approach a conversation with emotion or the intent of winning the argument. Like we said last week, this is a key advantage that we have on our team that other organizations don't. These skills are not a secret. It is not just the managers learning these skills. If everybody involved is aware of these skills, it makes it easier for us to practice the skills, hold each other accountable, and build strong relationships. Lastly, you should take this knowledge and apply it to all of your relationships. This will give you more opportunities to practice and you will be able to reap the rewards of deeper trust and better relationships across all facets of your life. Once again, there are so many more things to learn from these two books and from the corporate training that you may one day find yourself in. Please take the opportunity to ask your mentors or teammates for advice and direction when you find yourself approaching a crucial conversation. Take a look at the Trello cards with notes on how to hold a conversation or how to hold someone accountable with compassion. Next up in our workshops, we have project management and failure mode analysis, which is be being prepared by Mr. Gosar and Mr. MG. Following that, we have the vision and goals. And finally, tonight or tomorrow, please capture any feedback on this leadership workshop session in the keep fix try. It's right here, it's in your slides as well. And I'm very thankful to see so many things that have already been put in for the entire leadership workshops um, stuff, the crucial conversations. We got a lot of good keep fix and a lot of tries. I love the, seeing the tries. So please come on down here and give us, give us ideas um, because we wanna make this better for you guys. All right, thank you all very much for spending an hour and a half of your time with us and uh, enjoy not having a day of school tomorrow. Thank you. And uh, thank, thank you everyone you. for attending. Thank and thank you to Mr. John and Mr. Shop for leading us through an awesome leadership, leadership workshop this week. Good night all. Take care everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.